Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Is anyone out there? Good morning. Good to see you all. We're going to, as Tim said, pick up our series, which we're calling A Better Story, God, Sex, and Human Flourishing. And over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the big changes that have taken place in our nation and in other Western cultures, Western nations over the last 60 or 70 years, the sexual revolution that has been underway and is still going. And we've been asking the question, is there a better story? Does God's word have some things to say about human flourishing in the areas of relationships and marriage and singleness and about what our bodies are for and so on? And uh, last week, we heard a wonderful message from Tim around the, message, around the matter of divorce. And uh, it was full of compassion and truth. And we had a great testimony from Rod uh, of God's faithfulness in his life. And if you were not here last week, we were quite uh, thin on the ground last week because of half term. Go and listen to it, and it will be really encouraging for you. Today, we're going to be looking at building strong in the area of marriage. And once again, I want to appeal to those who are not married here to tune in and listen up. Just as I did the other week when we spoke on singleness, and I appeal to those who are married here to listen in, really for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because uh, we are a family here, and we want to be those that are in each other's lives, and we really do believe that uh, single people can and should be speaking into the lives of married friends, giving them support and encouragement and advice, and vice versa, that married people should be speaking into the lives of single people, giving them support and guidance and advice. And so it's the case that we're family together, and so we all need to hear these truths. We all need to hear the kind of things that I'm going to be speaking about today. But also, we don't know what the future holds. And I said the other week that for every married person here, and we hope and pray that every marriage here will go until, uh, until the very end, as it were, until death, but for every married person here, 50% of them will one day be single again. And so we don't, we don't really know what the future is going to hold, so we need to take these truths on board and uh, take them into our hearts because we don't know what our future will hold. We tend not to think into the future much, do we? I was 16, and I cleared out my room, and I got rid of a whole bunch of stuff that I now wish I'd kept for my children. Because I just didn't think at the time, hey, that might be useful one day. I was speaking to my children at breakfast a couple of days ago, and they said, Dad, why do we have to do maths? What, like, what's the deal? I'm never going to use this. I'm never, ever going to need to know long division. And if I ever, ever needed to, I'll just use a calculator, which is probably a fair point, to be honest. We're never really going to need to use uh, long division without a calculator. But we don't think long term often, and we don't think about the... That the come beyond the here and now. And so we sometimes sort of rule out, should I tune into this message? Because it's not really about me right now. We don't know what the future will hold. So we must tune in. So when it comes to building strong, there is a whole bunch of advice and wisdom out there for us. Um, some of it's good. Okay, I want to just say that from the outset. Some of the wisdom and advice that we might hear in the plethora of books and magazines that you can pick up around these things, some of that advice or wisdom may be good. We believe in something called common grace. We believe that sin hasn't gone unrestrained throughout the world, that there is still a semblance of God's wisdom and image. Uh, even in those that say, I do not believe he exists, we believe there is wisdom. And therefore, we don't dismiss it all and say, well, it's not from the Bible, and therefore, I'm just going to dismiss it. There is good wisdom out there, Okay. But there is also what the Bible calls an earthly wisdom, which is not helpful. And we need to be those that are able to discern between that. And the brother of Jesus, a guy called James, has a whole book in the Bible, which unimaginatively gets called James. And uh, he writes to the churches that he is serving about worldly wisdom. This is what he says. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, 
impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So there's, a, there's an earthly and a worldly wisdom that leads to disorder, selfish ambition and envy. I don't want that in my friendships or in my marriage or in my family. You don't need me to tell you that these things are present in the world. But life's full of God's wisdom. When we take his wisdom on board, when we believe, yes, his way is better. There is a better story. Then we'll know lives that are pure and peace-loving and considerate and submissive and full of mercy and good fruit and sincere. I, I know which one I want for my marriage. I will know which one I want for my friendship. So, so where do we start? Where do we start with all of this? We've got a massive Bible before us. Where on earth do we start? What I want to share with us today are two very simple foundations that we can put down in our marriages that will help us to build strong. You don't need to be a builder or an engineer to know that foundations are really, really important. If you don't put good foundations down, then a house can very suddenly collapse under the smallest bit of pressure. Or what can happen is if you have put some foundations down, but they're not quite right, is that over years, a house can start to slope and start to be bent out of shape, and it can start to look nothing like what you had originally hoped it would look like. So it's so important that we put foundations down in marriage. And so maybe if you're one day thinking, I may get married one day, these foundations are really going to be helpful. But additionally, if you're thinking, yeah, I'm, I've noticed the, the pressure, and I've noticed that we're starting to creak, maybe we're at a risk of collapse, there's still time to put some foundations down. It's not too late. But before we even come to these two foundations, I want to ask this question, why build strong? Now, that's probably an obvious question. Everyone wants a strong marriage, right, when they set out. But why build strong? Well, well firstly, when we build strong marriages, we glorify God. We, we point others to Him. In a world where commitment is kind of mocked in some ways, really, where sadly more and more it's the case that uh, people may... Um, bemoan the shortcomings of their spouse in front of those in the office or at the pub and right across the country this will be going on. I remember as a social worker I had uh, my first team meeting with the team and I was 22 or so and had not long been married and they found out I was married at a young age and um, they were shocked at that but they started to go around the table and talk about the fact that most of them there had been married at least once many of them twice and some of them three times. And that was kind of just the, that's just the norm. That's just kind of the reality of our, 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 our nation. But there is, in so many workplaces, and maybe you know this to be true in the place that you work, there can be this thing where sometimes it's banter, sometimes it's fun, but sometimes it's a downright painful thing. And people are bemoaning, my husband doesn't listen to me, or my husband does this, or my wife does this. And actually, as we build strong marriages where, where things are dealt with, where forgiveness is flowing, where there's, there's actually a, a listening to one another and, a, and a wanting the best for one another, as we do this, and as we refuse to kind of uh, speak badly of our spouse in front of others, we will actually shine. We will actually glorify God. We will point people to him. Now, we, we love to point people to Jesus. We love to do that as a church. That's what we're all about. And there's many ways we can do that. We can invite people to Alpha. We can invite people to our carol services in a few weeks' time. We can invite people to church on a Sunday. We can share with them what we believe. But actually, the Apostle Paul, in the book of Philippians, in chapter 2, he says that one such way that we can point people to Jesus is in the way we live out our relationships, whether that's friendships or marriage. And he says this, do everything without grumbling or complaining so that you may be blameless children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Did you get that? That one of the ways we shine, one of the ways we point people to Jesus is to not grumble or complain. That's a big deal. And it's a tendency that we can all, uh, we can, or it's a temptation for all of us to fall into. But actually, as we, as we refuse to grumble or complain, as we live out peaceful relationships, we can shine. We can point people to Jesus. We can highlight him. We can spotlight him. So we glorify God when we build strong. And secondly, when we build strong, we create a, a stable environment in which others can flourish. 
particularly thinking about the next generation and children, but it's also the case that others can come and flourish in amongst uh, a couple that are building strong foundations. And I know that it's a painful reality for quite a few people here that you have not seen a strong marriage in your parents' example. And I was speaking to someone very recently who said, I don't think I ever want to get married because I've seen what marriage is like and I don't want anything to do with that. And a few years ago, Sarah and I had a, a, a close friend, we still have a close friend, who her now husband proposed to her and she, she did not know what to do, did not know what to say because while she loved this guy very much, she had seen a very, very painful marriage in her parents' situation and she thought, I, I don't know if I ever really want that for myself. I don't know if I can ever really enter into that myself because it's so painful. And I know that's the reality for some of us here in this room today, that we may think, I, I don't know if I can ever go there. And listen, some of you will be called to do things for God that would, would, would mean that it's easier for you to be single. And we looked at that the other week. But some of you, you think, I'm not going to go and pursue marriage because I've just seen such pain in my own experience. And I don't, I don't want that. I was speaking to another church leader the other day, and he said they had a young lady live with them for a year. She was serving the church for a year. And at the end of the year, it came for her to move uh, on to university. And she said to them at the end of the year, you have restored my faith in marriage. And so you see how actually, even for those that are not our children, we can actually play a part in providing an environment which is stable and helpful for people where children can be nurtured. This is one of the, the key reasons why we want to build strong, because actually, for children, a home where marriage is strong, where foundations are down, is a really good place for their upbringing, a really good environment for their upbringing. But for some, it, it, it's so chaotic. And it can be something that can go from generation to generation. This was the case for one side of my family, which for generations has known divorce and marital breakdown, and still is, actually. And my mum and dad, praise God, became Christians when I was a child and put some good foundations down and, and, and went until death. And it's kind of broken that, I guess. But there can be a cycle of it just going and going and going. And maybe that's your experience today. So we want to look at how do we build strong in these, in these ways. We want to lay aside cynicism and being skeptical or fearful about marriage, because that doesn't honor, actually, the great mystery that the Bible says marriage is. Nor does idealism, which is kind of maybe more rooted in Hollywood and Disney, which doesn't ever acknowledge that marriage can be hard work, that forgiveness is required, that uh, it's not always a fairy tale. But we want to we kind of do away with cynicism on one hand and do away with kind of idealism on the other hand and see how do we, how do we build a marriage that is strong? We really, we want this for our, our family here. We want this for every single couple here. We want it for every single person who's single here who may be uh, cynical or fearful about marriage to deal with these things. Because we're not, we're not interested in, in growing a crowd here. That's just, not, that's just not our heart as a team. We want a family here where we look to help each other and deal with stuff. Because it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to have some mess, but when we come to Jesus, he wants us to walk through some stuff, and he wants to heal us, heal us of some stuff, and he wants us to put away some stuff and say, I'm putting that behind me. This is what he wants for us, friends. So what are these two foundations? Very quickly, and then we're going to invite some guests up to kind of hear from them a little more, and then we're going to have communion. The first foundation that I want to speak of is building marriage in the pattern of the gospel, building marriage in the pattern of the gospel. This is something we've covered in recent weeks. We've covered how Paul the Apostle, one of the early church leaders, one of the most influential figures uh, in the early church, how he describes marriage as a great mystery between a man and a woman that reflects Christ and the church. And I'm not going to do a better job than this video at depicting what that looks like. So if we can roll the video, that would be great. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, 
and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Symbols, shadows, parables. Sometimes this is about that. Flowers are about love. Signatures are about promises. Fireworks are about celebrations. Poppies are about war. And marriage is about the Christian gospel. This mystery is profound, says Paul, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So the wedding begins with the groom waiting at the front. He has pursued his bride and won her, and now he just has to wait. And when she eventually comes in, the whole room stands and stares at her beauty, her immaculate dress, pure and white and spotless. She gets presented to him, and they declare that they have no other partners. They hold hands. They make promises. To have and to hold, for better, for worse, forsaking all others as long as we both shall live. They exchange rings, signs of the covenant promises they have just made. They sign their names and make their vows legal. Then, as the ceremony concludes, they walk back out again, united as one. Everything he has is hers, and everything she has is his. Everybody celebrates with a meal. Later, they will express their physical union and share all of their possessions. She even takes on his name. Two have become one, and all this is about that. Jesus has made his people ready. His death for our sins has made us beautiful, pure, white, and spotless. We are given to him and to nobody else. We make promises to each other. Never will I leave you or abandon you, says Jesus, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. And we reply to him, I will forsake all other gods as long as we both shall live. There is an exchange of gifts. God gives us his spirit. There is a legal declaration. God says we are righteous in his sight. We walk on, united as one. Everything he has, his love, his power, his goodness, becomes ours. And everything we have, our sin, our shame, our past, becomes his. Everybody celebrates with a meal, bread and wine. We express our physical union through baptism in water. We give him access to all our possessions. We even take on his name and his identity. We become Christians. Two have become one. This is about that. This mystery is profound and I'm talking about Christ and the church. That's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5. Marriage is a pointer to a greater reality. It's a pointer to a greater story. And this is how our marriages are to be shaped. It may sound weird to say this, but our marriages are to be something of a role play, where where a husband represents Christ and where a wife represents the church. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And in their love, this is so important, there is to be initiative taken. You see, Jesus' love for the church wasn't just sentimental feelings. It wasn't just, I really want to have a people for myself one day. I'm I'm drawn to that notion. No, no, he initiated. In his love, he came down. In his love, he obeyed his father throughout his life even to the point of death on a cross. There was an an initiative taken by Jesus. He acted. And I sincerely believe that in the pattern of marriage, husbands are to be initiative takers, not to be passive. This is what happened with Adam, the first man in the garden. He was passive. He allowed some things to happen because he just wasn't taking initiative. And all sorts of mess came from that. And often when we uh, are walking with people who are struggling in these things, it's often the case that a husband is not being an initiative taker in some ways, being passive in some ways. It's not always the case, but it's often the case. That actually husbands aren't looking to say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look to follow in Jesus' pattern here and lead in a godly way. 
and to take initiative and to sacrifice, actually, and, and lay my life down for my wife. There's an initiative that needs to be taken by husbands, and that's why I'm so thrilled when I hear of men saying to their wives, let's go on the marriage course. Let's read a book together that's going to uh, help strengthen our marriage. Let's, let's go and see that person or that couple and, and just talk some things through. I'm thrilled when I hear that. I'm thrilled that we've got 10 or so couples on our marriage course right now where there's people have said, I'm just going to take initiative in this. I'm not going to allow uh, the slump. I'm not going to allow some things to kind of start to fall away. This isn't to say that wives should be passive, far from it. But husbands, can you, can you see how in the shape of the gospel, Jesus loved his, his bride, the church, and he, he acted, he initiated, he was not passive. He laid his life down for her. He had a vision for what she would become. We see that in Ephesians 5. Read it for yourself later. He had a vision for what his wife would become. I want to ask husbands, do we have a, a vision for our wives and for what our marriages could become? Do we have a vision for that? I'm not talking about looks here. I'm talking here about what do you want your marriage to be? Do you want it to be one that really does mirror Christ and the church? In a beautiful way. Do you want it to be a place where others can come and take shelter in your, under your, in your home, under your wings, as it were, where you can together work as a team and input into the life of your children or any spiritual children that God may give you? Do you have a vision for this? And wives, in the shape of the gospel, you are to receive the leadership of your husband. It's like the church receives the leadership of Jesus the headship of Jesus. And Steph Liston spoke into this so helpfully a few months ago when he was amongst us. And he, he said, does that mean that submission to husbands look like, looks like doing stuff that's just sinful or wrong? Of course it doesn't. Does it mean that wives never initiate ideas or speak up when there's not cl clarity about the way forward? Of course not. Does Jesus' love for the church ever look oppressive? Of course not. But there's a glad hey, I want to come under your headship. I want to come under your leadership. Leadership. There's a glad submission to a husband's sacrificial leadership, just as there is for the church in response to what Jesus has done for her. So we, just, we say, Jesus, I'm, I'm following in your ways. I believe you've got what is best for us. This is hugely countercultural teaching. And if we're in deep into some of the, the worldly wisdom, then we'll start to get quite twitchy at this point and start to think, I'm not happy with this. I'm not comfortable with this. We've really got three choices when we see the Bible's teaching on this. One is to say, I just don't think it's the word of God. And I'm not going to go there. I'm not going it to, it's just completely irrelevant to me. The second is we can say, well, yeah, I think it is the word of God, but I'm a bit embarrassed by it. And I don't really, I don't really like it. And I'm not really going to investigate the beauty of what might be in this. Or the third is to say, God's way is the best way. And I'm left to my own devices, I don't really know what to do. So I'm going to lean into this and see the beauty of the picture that we see here. And, and it's going to take work, and it's going to, we're sometimes going to get things right, and sometimes we're going to get things wrong, but we're going to work at this. Those are the choices we've got there. Do we believe that this Bible, this, this, this book we have before us, is God's word? Do we believe it's profitable for us? Do we believe it's actually going to shape our lives? Or are we kind of like not sure on that? Or are we, a bit, are we sure of it, but are we a bit embarrassed by it? Listen, friends, as we lean into what God has for us, as we, as we kind of consider the, the, the gospel, the good news that we celebrated already today, and we'll celebrate some more, we'll see that this teaching is actually really beautiful. And it's not to be embarrassed by. And we can lean into it. So, the first foundation, and there's more I could say, I'm sure, but the first foundation is we look to build in the pattern of the gospel. The second foundation is this, we want to build in the shape of the gospel. And this is true of every friendship that we want to see formed here, as well as marriage. We want to build in the, sorry, I've talked about the shape of the gospel and the power of the gospel. We want to be, live out, our second foundation is living out our lives in the power of the gospel. The grace that God has shown us cannot leave us unchanged. All that we've celebrated this morning, all that we've worshipped him for this morning, it, it cannot leave us unchanged. His, his grace that we've received should now be lived out in our lives. It should be kind of outworked uh, horizontally, as it were, the vertical grace that we've received. While we were still 
the enemies of God, Jesus died for us. While we were still sinners, Jesus came and he lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. Perfect obedience to his Father. Never a moment of regret. And he lived, lived that perfect life for you and I and then he died in our place on the cross. And he rose again. And it's these truths as we receive them, we, we understand we've been washed clean. We've been completely forgiven. We've been adopted into the family of God forever. We've been given a sure and certain future, a bright hope. When we receive this, it should impact all of our relationships. It's not just a, a theology that we believe. It's not just something that we, our minds ascend to. No, no, this should impact everything. And in Tim's message last week, we, we saw in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus being quizzed by the religious leaders, the Pharisees, about divorce. And they kind of had this notion of, Jesus, is it, can we divorce our wives for any reason? Or are there particular exceptions where we can divorce our wives? There was genuine debate going on about, is it enough if our wives burn our dinner? That was what was going on. And Jesus, is, his amazing wisdom comes through in Matthew 19. But the chapter that precedes that, Matthew 18, is not there by accident. It's really intentional and purposeful. Because in Matthew chapter 18, Peter, who I think is one of the disciples that we can most identify with, kind of puts his foot in it quite a lot, tries to suggest some things for Jesus, and realizes that Jesus is much wiser than him. He says to Jesus, Jesus, if, if someone, if a friend of mine sins against me, how many times should I forgive them? I'm, am I right in thinking about seven? Is that about right, Jesus? Seven times is about right. He goes, try 77 times, Peter. And then Jesus goes on to tell this story about a very, very wealthy king who calls to him all those that owe him money. There's a lot of people that owe him money. And the first guy that comes owes him a huge debt. I looked into what it would be in today's money, looking at how much was a talent worth, because that's what they, the, the measurement of currency they had. And I was trying to do the maths on my calculator, and uh, it made an error sign. Okay, so we're talking billions and billions of pounds. This guy owes the king. And he says to the king, I can't pay you back. I can't pay this money back. So the king says, well, you and your family, you're going to have to become my slaves. And this guy is distraught, and he starts to beg, please, 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 is there any other way? And the king lets him off his debt. He doesn't just let him off his debt. The king actually, if you think about it for a moment, the king takes the hit. The king doesn't receive the money that is rightfully his. He sacrifices something hugely costly, and he says, I'm going to forgive you your debt. So this forgiven guy goes on his way, and then he decides, I'm going to call in my debtors, all those that owe me money. And the first guy comes to him, and he owes this guy about 840 pounds. And so the forgiven guy says, come on, it's time for you to pay up, and the guy cannot pay. And so he starts to throttle him. He starts to strangle him. And this guy's begging, please don't kill me. And in the end, he has him thrown in prison. And what happens when the king gets a hold of this story? He's really angry. He's really mad. And this is quite shocking, but this is what it says in the Bible. The king says, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, the king handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And then Jesus says this, meek and mild Jesus, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. It's a powerful story, right? Jesus had a knack for that. But it's a story that really is supposed to change us. The point he's making is this. Do for others what God has done for you. Show mercy as you have been shown mercy in your marriages, in the wake of the gospel, in the power of the gospel. Do for your spouse what God did for you in Christ. Forgive. Don't punish them for their shortcomings. Don't hold grudges. Don't divorce someone because they burnt your dinner. You see, how in, you see how intentional this is, that it comes right before the whole conversation around divorce? 
This is how we build strong foundations, through, through soaking our hearts in all that God has done for us, in the mercy that he has shown towards us. I don't believe this means we never raise issues, that we just overlook everything and just kind of never talk about it. No, I think we should. We talk through difficult things, we seek change, but, but it's got to be the, the grace of God is going to be right at the foundation of marriage. The gospel helps us to do away with self-righteousness. And self-righteousness is a big killer in marriages. Because it can be the case that we can become self-righteous when we lose sight of what God has done for us. And that if we were the only people in the world, Jesus would still have had to go to the cross for us. And we would have been the one nailing in the, the nails, hammering in the nails into his hands. If we lose sight of that, then we can look towards our spouse and we can say, how dare you do that? How could you do that? I would never do that. You see how self-righteousness becomes a killer? And we look at someone else and think, I am better than them. Instead of saying, no, I, I've actually been forgiven so much. And left to my own devices, I could do so terrible things. But God has shown mercy to me. He's reached into my life. We see how this transforms things when this is a foundation. We've got to be melted by the good news regularly that we have been forgiven an astronomical debt, each one of us. And if you don't believe that, then maybe there's still some more things that God's got to show you. We've been, each one of us, forgiven an astronomical debt, and we've got to be melted by this. We need to celebrate the gospel regularly. This is why we come together. This is why we have communion that we're going to have in a little while. This is why we sing songs of the gospel, why we sing songs, because we're not only singing to God, but we're singing to our own souls, and we're singing to each other of his mercy and grace, and we're reminded of it, and our hearts get melted by it. And actually, we start to treat others with the same grace that we've received. Do you understand how important this is? We're not coming together for some empty ritual here. We're not coming together because it's Sunday and that's what we do. We're coming together to be thrilled again by the gospel and to allow it to change our hearts and to, to come and, and allow it to change our relationships with others as well. There's all kinds of helpful, practical advice out there. I think we'll hear some in a moment, but... It doesn't matter what love language you have and whether you've worked all of that out if there's not a foundation of the grace of God in your life. If there's not a foundation of, I had a huge debt and God has forgiven me a huge debt at great cost to himself. And now I can, I can treat others with that same grace. I'm not going to hold things over their heads. I'm not going to remind them of things that happened years ago. I'm not going to look upon them and say, I'm so much better than you. No, I've been forgiven, an astronomical debt. I'm not going to be like that guy who then calls in his debtors and strangles them and throttles them and throws them in prison. You see, this has got to be a foundation, friends. We build marriages in the pattern of the gospel, but we build marriages in the power of the gospel. And we need to have our hearts repeatedly melted by what God has done. Listen, marriage is under pressure from many quarters. I think we're in an era maybe where there's more pressure than at any other time. There's all kinds of stories out there that say it's just easy if you just leave it behind. There's a massive rise of pornography and accessibility of pornography that shows people, hey, you can just have all that you want without the hard work. But it's a lie. You don't have all that you want. There's the rising pressures of the cost of living and so on as well. All these things just put pressure on marriage. We need to have right at the heart the grace of God, the good news of all he's done for us. We're going to invite some guests up now to uh, hear from them. We've been, I've really enjoyed that over recent weeks. Have you? Hearing from different people and uh, hearing how this lands in their lives. And I've invited some dear friends, Robin and Sajani, to come and share. So come on up, Robin and Sajani. Let's give these guys a round of applause. <laughs> Have we got another microphone as well? We'll get two. That'll be helpful. Thank you. Now, Robin and Sajani have been part of this church for many years, and uh, they serve the church in so many ways, and uh, they are great role models for me and Sarah. We've spent time with these guys uh, in so many ways, actually. I really mean that. Uh, we actually have got a picture of these guys 
when they were married 21 years ago. So here they are, looking good, guys. And you're still looking good. Come over a little bit more. And just, you want to just come over a little bit more. So can you tell us um, a little bit about yourselves? Uh, I know now, you, we all know now how long you've been married. Uh, tell us a bit about your family, maybe where you're from. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so Sajni and um, we were born in India, Mumbai, uh, the city Mumbai. And uh, we, were, we grew up in traditional Christian families. Um, but it was in 1992 that uh, Sajni made a commitment and came to the Lord. And in um, 1994, I, I came to the Lord. Um, we've been married since 2001, and that's how we look back then. We came to Ipswich in 2005, and we've been part of Hope Church ever since, you know, the first, it was the first church that we came into, and Fantastic. we've been here since then. Uh, we've got two, we've been blessed with two boys, Jonathan, who's just headed off to university, uh, Jason, who's just started sixth form. And uh, again, it's, it's really a blessing that both Jonathan and Jason are followers of Jesus. Yeah. And yeah, it's been a blessing. Wonderful. That's great. Okay. So, I don't know who's going to answer this one, but what are some things just to consider uh, and think through, and maybe to do even, before marriage? What, what would be some helpful things that you might have to say on that? Yeah, so we've been blessed by, uh, you know, people who have really taken us through principles for marriage, the word of God, etc. So, you know, all that we are going to say is things that we have heard, things that we have practiced, right? right? And um, I remember a preacher saying that Adam had it very easy. Mm. He slept, he woke up, and there was Eve, <laughs> right? So, and, and then he went off into poetry, flesh of my flesh, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, but I think one thing that, as a believer, that, you know, we should have a strong conviction about is the fact that you will only marry a, a believer, mm. right? Mm. Um, if you sing songs like, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, mm. uh, Christ alone, mm. cornerstone, mm. then your home and marriage should also be built on it's nothing really less, right? And so it's very important to have that in a, a strong conviction. Yeah. It's not optional. Mm. And again, like you said, there's a lot of helpful Christian books out there mm. on marriage. Uh, but I think the Bible is the most helpful. Yeah. And you should have a strong foundation in God's word. Mm. Uh, you know, that's, again, not negotiable. You have to have that into in your, uh, in your life. Mm. Um, and the other thing that, again, you know, I grew up, I uh, had a brother as a sibling. We grew up with a bunch of boys. And so I think it's something that, was really helpful for me was to understand that God has designed and created women different to men. Yeah. And that's something to be, uh, you know, appreciated, celebrated. Yeah. Um, and even when we look at, you know, each other, I know um, the jury is out on this one, whether women talk more and <laughs> men talk more. Uh, but if we look at, uh, you know, and, and there's personality traits, but if we look at our own, you know, our own selves, Sajni needs her 15,000 words a day. <laughs> and, and I could do it happily with minus 500. Right? So That's great. I'm, I'm probably going to be in three days silence after this. <laughs> I love that. That's so good. Was there anything you wanted to add on that? Yes, Sajni? please. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, also, before we got married, it was, I mean, we did spend time praying for our spouses, to be spouses. It is important to pray for the right person and uh, ask God for guidance in this area. Uh, but also, in, uh, in the same way, in praying that I would be the right person too, mm. to evaluate that, am I the right person for him, mm. to think it through. Mm. So that does help. Yeah. Uh, Another thing that really helped Robin and me was uh, one of Robin's cousins gave us a book to just discuss things, uh, especially that will confront us after marriage. Mm. Because we spent a lot of time about the big day, yeah. uh, about the food, the clothes, the guests we invite, uh, the honeymoon that we'll go to. And all that is important, but there is a lifetime to live together. Yeah. And uh, on uh, during courtship period and during... Uh, 
date time, dating times, you're not going to bring out those hard topics. Mm. So the book really helped us to bring those topics out, topics like work, children, um, families, extended families, mm. uh, sex, money, mm. you know, mission. What are we going to do about all this? And that book did help us to bring these topics into the forefront, talk mm. through them, uh, get each other's views on it, yeah. uh, have a clarity in it, and also prepared us to, you know, see what's coming our way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really, really helpful. Kind of just looking beyond that big gleaming day, in, but actually to the to the beyond and mm -hmm. considering there's going to be lots of stuff to work through. That's really, really helpful. Wonderful. So, what are some of the? We I've talked a couple about a couple of foundations today, and maybe you want to build on those. But are there other principles around building a strong marriage that you've gleaned that you've learned and put into practice over your 21 years you did say a lot anyway uh tom so <laughs> <laughs> i might be just add, i will be just adding to that yeah. uh, so uh, one of the things that uh we looked at or we we kind of follow we try to follow is uh in galatians and in Ephesians and in colossians i think i'll is it okay if I look at yeah, mine? Yeah, yeah. So in Colossians it says, uh, bear with one another mm. and forgive as God forgave you mm. and put on love mm. and God will bring the unity in it. Mm. Um, and in Ephesians it says, do not sin in your anger. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry mm. um, and don't give the devil a foothold. Uh, so it's, you know, I had to remind, um, or rather we, especially me, had to remind myself that I have to bear with him. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> He's only a man. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, bear with him, apologize or forgive, um, you know, put on love, make that effort mm. to put it on and uh, see God bringing the unity. Mm. There will be times when we lose our tempers and, you know, it's okay, but apologize, mm. um, especially if not straight away, do it before the end of the day. Mm. Don't let it fester really good. Um, because those little things will add up. Yeah. It'll yeah, and I think something that we, we have followed religiously, I would say, is that we don't bring out past mistakes. Mm. I think as Len said, we don't go back into the garbage and fish those old things yeah. that really you know good. we did wrong. Um, and, and we've stuck to that. Mm. Uh, we never bring back anything we have spoken about and forgiven each other for. Mm. And um, I think one of the reasons it's difficult to forgive is the whole ego, the pride, the arrogance, right? Mm. And again, the Bible is very helpful and we remind ourselves that we are like grass. Mm. Um, you know, we remind ourselves that in Timothy it says that you brought nothing into this world, yeah. right? And uh, in Corinthians, uh, you know, Paul says everything you have anyway is a gift of God. Mm -hmm. So what are you really boasting about? You know, what's this mm -hmm. ego about? Jeremiah talks about let the man, you know, let not people um, be boastful about their wisdom, their strength, their wealth, mm -hmm. but be boastful in the fact that you know the Lord, Yeah. right? And if you know the Lord, you'll know that his way is uh, one of, um, you know, humbleness mm. and not pride, mm. right? God opposes the proud, yeah. but gives grace to the humble, yeah. right? So I think that's another important uh, principle that we've stuck to. Really good, really good. And are there any other, just, you have hundreds of people to invest in here, any other bits of advice or principles that you would say, I want these guys to hear this. Yeah, I, we lived in five different cities since we've got married. Um, and just like I spoke to Kathy and Brian, in this few minutes of hello, mm. talk to the person next to you a minute, um, Kathy also followed the same principle of finding a good church where we went to. The first thing, and that was top of our prayer list, you know, pray for a good church, that we would be surrounded by Christian believers who would support us, who would build us up, mm. who would pushes along the way uh, with God. Mm, mm. So I think really it's good. crucial to surround yourself with yeah. Christians. Yeah, yeah and um, yeah, I think, um, again, love, the Bible has a lot to say about love, and mm. you know, I think you touched upon something very important, that Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. Right? Mm. 
And um, I think it's it's very important to know, and, and Jesus Christ didn't have a warm, fuzzy feeling when he was, <laughs> you know, dying on the cross. So I think it's very important to know that love is a matter of the heart and emotions, but also a matter of the will. Yeah. Right? Jesus said, let not my will, but your will be done. Mm. Right? And mm. his loving death on the cross was, uh, you know, enacting God's will. Yeah. Right? So love is as much a matter of the heart as it is a matter of the will. Yes. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's great. Then I think a couple of things, yeah. uh, just quickly, um, you know, there will be stresses in life. Mm. Um, you know, for us, uh, work was a uh, site of stressful area because of the number of transitions we have made. We, like Sydney said, in our marriage, we've had to live in five different cities. Mm. Um, you know, my work um, re required a lot of travel. Mm. Sydney's work has offset inspections that are sprung upon and, you know, mm. cause all sorts of issues. Colleagues that are not helpful, deadlines that are not met, targets that are not met, etc. And uh, we need to talk about these stresses mm. that each other is going through, but not make sure that it doesn't creep into our marriage, yeah. right? That they yeah. don't enact themselves in the marriage. Mm. Right? I mm. think that's something that's very important, uh, yeah. especially in this day and age. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, uh, is there any other? I think communication is also a key where, you know, especially like Robin said about him traveling a lot, but, uh, that didn't put an end to the communication. I still had to keep up with my words. Uh, if not <laughs> over the phone, I would ma mail him, I would text him, I would <laughs> let him know about the day in and day out, the mundane, the routine, yeah. just to know what's happening on the home front, um, just to keep him in the picture. Mm. So communication mm. is definitely a key. And also finding things that we enjoy, we would do together. It this can be a simple thing like going for a walk, uh, spending time planning a surprise party for a friend. Mm. Uh, for you, it could be dancing, golfing, anything that you enjoy doing together as a couple. And, you know, try doing it, try fitting it in. It, it's worth it. That's really good. Um, also, I can say that our marriage is uh, not perfect. Uh, sure. <laughs> Robin still needs a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> But it is a happy one. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. it's only because of Jesus. Yeah, wonderful. Great stuff. Thank you so much, guys. Thank really, you. really helpful. Thank you. Bless you. I really do mean it when I say these guys have been, have been for Sarah and I, really wonderful role models, and um, they put this into practice in their lives. And so, uh, yeah, go and get time with them. Have them over for dinner and quiz them some more. We're going to uh, finish by taking communion together. I wonder if the band could be ready to lead us in a final song. We come back to the gospel. We need to remember what Jesus has done for us. Tim and Kathy Keller have written a book called The Meaning of Marriage, which I'd highly recommend to you. And in this book, they say this. Without a continual filling of your soul's tank with the glory and love of the Lord... Such submission to the interests of others is virtually impossible to accomplish for any length of time without becoming resentful. So as we look now at Jesus and his looking out not for his own interests but for our interests, let's have our, our soul's tank filled as it were. I want to read to you from Philippians 2. So this is what Paul writes. If there is any encouragement in Christ any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, and being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not, account, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, 
even death on a cross. And therefore God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is our example in this. Contrary to the world's messaging, which might say to put others' needs before your own is somehow oppressive. Jesus Christ was the one who came and paid the debt that we had no chance of paying. Absolutely no hope. And he laid his life down on the cross, obedient to his Father, even to the point of death. So let's stand together. I want us to do this a little differently today. We've got these communion cups, which are a little bit fiddly, but we have a wafer here in these cups. Let's just get that out, shall we? And remember the body of Jesus broken for us. You might want to even break it before you. And just remember his body broken on the cross to pay your debt. Eat that in just a moment. Well, you can eat that now. I'm going to keep talking. I'm going to eat mine in a moment. I wonder if we might take the, the juice that we have here and get that ready. And I wonder if we could do this a little differently. And before we drink, just can we toast the king? Can we say to the king who paid our debt? Should we say that together? To the king who paid our debt. Let's remember Jesus on the cross for us. His blood spilt for us that we might be washed clean. Thank you, Lord, for your great mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you, you laid your life down for us, Lord Jesus. We want this to permeate all of our relationships. We want you to, would you build strong marriages in this church, Lord, for your glory, for the good of others? Would we be people completely saturated by all that you've done for us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. Well, um, this morning we do stand in awe, Lord, of the lengths you would go to win for yourself such as us. <laughs> I remember I was thinking about this before the service. I don't know if any of you have seen the, the, the plasticine kids movie called The Miracle Maker about Jesus. There's a scene where he calls Matthew the tax collector. And Matthew, the look on his face and the expression, Me? Me? I was watching a kid's movie and I was in tears. Me. But me. But you. But me. You know me. Me. Not only has he called you, he's gone the distance. Taking all of your failure, all of your shame upon his shoulders and giving you his glorious white robe, dress righteousness. That, that video of the this is about that. I was in tears again this morning. This is just wonderful. The glory of the picture of a bridegroom going, purchasing for himself a bride that we could be clothed in righteousness, secure in his love. Just thank you again this morning, Father, for sending your son. Jesus, we love to be your bride. We love to be your bride. We love your commitment to us. We love your bravery for us, your courage for us. We love your wisdom for us. We love your initiative taking. We love you because you first loved us. What a wonderful husband you are. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Just as Tom was speaking, I was aware of maybe a few in the room who were saying, I... I don't have a problem with anything Tom said. I believe in it, but I can't help it that I'm married to a, an unbeliever. I just want to say three things, if I can remember them. First, 1 Corinthians says something about continue loving. Love, love your spouse. And you can actually make them holy, it says. It doesn't mean you'll make them Christians. It means you'll have a great impact on their life. And who knows, they may come through. The second thing I was going to say is, 
many stories of spouses who have come through and followed. As we just heard, Robin and Sajani. Sajani was first a believer. Robin, a few years later, became to be a believer. Keep hoping in the Lord. Keep praying for them. And thirdly, don't walk that alone. There's people in this church who want to walk with you and keep praying for your spouse with you and keep encouraging you. This isn't a message that was supposed to make you feel any sense of, it doesn't work for me. No, it works for you. God is faithful for you. And then just secondly, I want to encourage us, let's not be those, Tom said three categories. We can either disregard the Bible, we can hold to it with a kind of embarrassed, embarrassing teaching, or we can celebrate it. We can celebrate it. This is the King of glory. He knows what he's doing. Let's not learn from the world. We looked at the world last week. Marriage is, we don't know what we're doing on our own. And let's not just say, well, God says this, I'll try, maybe. Let's run into his great picture. It's beautiful. Let's trust him for marriage. Father, I want to pray for those married, unmarried, divorced, not yet married. Lord, we, we pray for you to bless us with our view of the great bridegroom and the bride. One day there'll be a feast and you've invited us. Lord, help us to see that with such wonder and awe, not underestimating your love for us, submitting to you, following you, loving you as you first loved us. Amen. Bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. 